So it's a wild dance floor there at the molecular level. Everything is in constant motion. Atoms in any state above zero Kelvin. They're grooving. <laughs> they never stop moving. Um, and then, like, how fast they move depends on how high above zero Kelvin you are. Keep increasing the temperature, you keep increasing, I don't know, the BPM in the club. We're going to use intermolecular forces to explain things like, why does water make a perfect sphere in zero gravity? Essentially, it comes down to these intermolecular forces. We talked about a lot about bonds between atoms, right? And even, like, ionic bonds. And those are really strong attractive forces that exist because there's a reduction in energy. Um, intermolecular forces take place between either atoms that are separated, but mostly we're going to talk about molecules, um, and how that explains liquids and solids. Um, it's essential for physiological processes, since we're not going to get super far into this. Um, does anybody know what heavy water is? Yeah, it's water, but instead of hydrogen, it's deuterium. So it's D2O. So deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen that has more neutrons, has one more neutron. Uh, hypothetically, if you drank deuterium, it would eventually kill you because it would replace all of the hydrogens in your body. And those hydrogens, or so the deuterium, these heavy water or these heavy hydrogens, they move more slowly than hydrogen, because they're heavier. And so it would slow down all of the physiological processes in your body as they get more and more incorporated. Similarly, it would probably increase a little bit the melting point and boiling point and of different things. Just like these intermolecular forces are essential for physiological processes, like smell and taste, are actually intermolecular forces between things that you smell and taste and your taste buds and your olfactory bulb in your nose. They stick in there for a little bit, triggers a signal that gets sent to your brain. So I'm sure you're all familiar with what solids, liquids, and gases are. Right? Gases have tons of space between them. Liquid and solids are all, we would say, touchingly close. They're like shoulder to shoulder. Um, the atoms or molecules have basically no space between them. So one of the biggest differences between solids and liquids is the movement or the ability to move or the freedom of movement between the particles. In a solid, they basically have no freedom to move. They don't get to go anywhere. In a liquid, all of them can move around each other, which is why when you pour something, it pours. Because as you move it or slosh it, those atoms and molecules move around each other and deform, and so the shape can change. But solids, Fortunately, there are solids, and they don't deform. They're all moving. So state changes, right? If you take ice and you heat it up, eventually it melts. If you heat it up enough, then that water will start to boil and turn into a gas. <laughs> and it will leave, just like that Apple Pencil. But we can also use pressure to induce transitions between gas and liquid states. You reduce the pressure enough. This is why, actually, if you've ever been camping anywhere with high enough altitude, it takes a lot longer to cook pasta, because water boils at a much lower temperature at higher, not much, maybe, but it boils at a lower temperature at high altitudes. It's also, so on the back of, back of any package of pasta, it says you sh almost always says you should add some salt to the water, because it increases the boiling temperature just a little bit. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I always test the pasta before I take it out. If you don't use salt, when you test the pasta at the end of the 11 minutes for like spaghetti from Costco, it's still underdone, right? It's still got too much bite to it. If you add salt, then 11 minutes is actually perfect. <laughs> so you're increasing the amount of time that it's cooking at a higher temperature, or you're increasing the temperature so you can do it for a shorter time. So pressure can affect that as well. We'll talk about that. Actually, this is something that I experienced recently, and we'll explain this also. At my cousin's wedding a few weeks ago, it was raining that day. Previous day was beautiful. It was an outdoor wedding. The next day, it was pouring rain <laughs> the entire day. It was freezing cold. So they bought these propane heaters. And the propane heaters were great, but after they had been running for four or five hours, however long it was, 
The thing about propane is inside the tank, it's a liquid, and it turns into a gas. And then you use the gas and you burn the gas. As that boils, essentially evaporates, the tank can cool down enough that it gets below the boiling point of propane. And then propane stops coming out of the tank. So towards the end of the night, I don't think it was that the propane tanks were low. It's that they had gotten so cold from running all day that there was a lot less propane coming out. So we'll talk about why you lose extra energy doing that. There's just too much of it wanted to stay as a liquid, basically. So it's kept in there at pressure also. And so when you open the tank, you're like giving somewhere for that pressure to escape. But it only wants to escape if it's a gas. Otherwise, it stays as liquid. And I did reach inside in some of the tanks. The tank I, could, I was at was completely covered in ice. <laughs> Very cold. Yeah, have you ever used like the air in a can? Same kind of thing. They get really cold because you're, you need heat energy to even do any amount of vaporization. Which of these, A, B, or C, is water vapor? Yes, A. Can't be C. This would be ionization of water, separating it into different things. This would be electrolysis, converting it into hydrogen and oxygen gases. Like I said, beginning here, a lot of recap. So we talked about intermolecular forces some, and ultimately it comes down to the structure of the particles. So this is why it's useful to be able to quickly predict the shapes of molecules. So stuff that's polar is gonna have a stronger intermolecular force. So if it's nonpolar is not gonna have that intermolecular force and is therefore gonna be weaker. So things that are polar generally have high melting points and boiling points. Weak forces generally low melting and boiling points. I guess one way to think about this is opposite charges. So most of our intermolecular forces come from opposite charges, which again, Coulomb's law relates the charge and difference or in distance to that attractive energy. So basically, if we can get things closer or greater charge or magnitude, then we're, for both of those things, we get greater attractions. So smaller things and more charged things tend to have stronger intermolecular forces. So for very small molecules, they get closer, to, or very small atoms, they can get very close together. And in general, we're gonna be talking about Again, we're talking about intermolecular forces, so a distance of 300 picometers versus an actual covalent bond, which is 96 picometers. So this force is decreased by R, so it's gonna be about three times weaker because it's about three times the distance. So we talked last time on Monday about intermolecular forces. It's the stickiness that holds molecules together outside of the bonds between individual atoms. So these are not formal bonds, but they are an attractive force. The weakest attractive force that is present in all atoms and molecules, never forget that, it's in everything. So if I ask you to list all the forces that are present in something, dispersion force should always be there. Should be your go-to, it's always yes, there is dispersion force. But it's a really weak force. It's also called the London force. And it's a result of these fluctuating electron distributions within atoms or molecules. So in this image here, if in frame one, these black dots are our electrons. They're on opposite sides of the nucleus, roughly. Frame two, opposite sides of the nucleus. Frame three, for an instant, they're on the same side. So when they're on the same side, that means that the electrons have the negative charge of the atom. So the negative charge is now on that side and the other side is positive. But again, in frame four, that probably goes away. So it's instantaneous. It exists for just a moment. And that's why everything can have dispersion forces is because everything has electrons. I guess except for H plus hydrogen. But those electrons moving around causes that charges to be unevenly distributed. So we call that an instantaneous dipole. And as you probably know, we'll talk about dipole-dipole forces next. This is like that, but only for an instant, and then it's gone. It can also induce a dipole in an adjacent atom. Here we've got something that maybe formed an instantaneous dipole next to another atom. And now because it's the far right 
atoms, electrons are on the left. The electrons in the center atom, they move away from those because they don't want to be close to that negative charge. And then on the other side, they move to the other side. So they all get pushed to the other, to the left. In the next instant, they might get pushed to the right, or they might just, again, be evenly distributed. So it's instantaneous. Again, it's got a magnet that just flicked on for a little bit every once in a while. And then if you put it up against another magnet, then they all kind of line up for a second, but then stop working again. Be a pretty terrible magnet. It would not stick to the fridge. Because every most of the time it wouldn't. Sometimes it would for a little bit and then it would fall off. So dispersion forces are largely determined by how many electrons can be moved around. And in general, we can relate that to molar mass. Because a higher molar mass means that it's a larger atom, which means that it's got more protons, more neutrons, which means it has more electrons. So if we're looking at helium, which these pictures from before, pretty good picture of helium, it's got two electrons. So those two electrons moving over to the same side can cause an instantaneous dipole. But if we add more electrons in, say a neon or argon or krypton or xenon, and we have more electron shells, we have a larger area and more electrons, so those electrons can all jump over to the one side of their orbitals, and we get stronger instantaneous dipoles. We call that polarizability, or how much something can be polarized, meaning how much can we create an instantaneous dipole. So one of the things that we're going to do a lot of is comparing boiling points and using that as a proxy for, meaning a stand-in for intermolecular forces. Because to boil something or to melt something, you have to overcome intermolecular forces. The stronger those forces, the more energy you need to overcome them. So xenon here has the strongest dispersion force because it has the strongest dispersion force. We can measure that as its boiling point. It takes the most energy to turn xenon into a gas. Another thing that can affect this is the shape. Anything that can have a larger area of interaction, so these longer molecules generally have higher boiling points than more spherical shaped molecules. And that's simply because these can interact over a larger area. If you had um, if you had glue on your finger touching a surface versus glue over your entire hand and touching that surface. If just your finger can touch, it's a lot easier to pull your finger off because it's only sticky at that one point. But if your whole hand is covered in glue, then you're feeling that attractive force over the entire surface area. So even though these are the same mass, the n-pentane, which is a straight line, instead of the neopentane, which is this tetrahedral, N-pentane has a higher boiling point, higher or stronger intermolecular forces. So there are some other factors other than molar mass at play when it comes to dispersion forces. In general, you can compare things in terms of mass first, and then compare in terms of the shape, if necessary. Pretty linear. I think actually there's a trend here that's not being shown. Oh, it was for melting points. I don't remember exactly what the trend is, but odd and even numbered alkanes, as these are called, so different numbers of carbons, have different melting and boiling points because they stack together better. And I think it's the odd numbers that are generally have higher melting points. But here we're just looking at boiling points, so as you increase the length of the chain, we also increase the area where those electrons can be polarized across. And so stronger intermolecular forces. So which halogen has the highest boiling point? Iodine. Whichever one's the largest. So we're using molar mass here because it's really more about the size, but the molar mass, as molar mass increases, size generally increases. And here, since we're on the periodic table, going down a row, chlorine, bromine, Iodine. Iodine's a lot larger than chlorine, and it's also larger than bromine, so iodine's going to have the highest boiling point. Yeah, probably not across the whole periodic table. Because if you get to... We can compare these, because they're all halogens, and they're all nonmetals, and so they will behave largely the same. And in fact, iodine is a solid at room temperature. 
But yeah, if you get into metals, there's a lot of other things happening with metals, with non-metals, um, or sorry, metalloids. Yeah, as long as you're comparing things of the same type, so maybe comparing metals to other metals, but even then, metals are a bad example because metals are weird. You have things like mercury. Uh, but when we're keeping things simple, we're talking about molecular compounds, molar mass can be used as a proxy. All right, so the force, I guess I'll say, is fundamentally the same as the dispersion force, but it's permanent. So dispersion force means every once in a while we get this polarization where one side's positive, one side's negative, but that comes and goes all the time. In dipole force, now we've got those electrons that are permanently shifted because of the atoms involved. So if you've got something like an oxygen that makes this side more negative, makes the other side more positive, right? Electronegativity difference, and it's asymmetric. So that means that we always have more electrons around that more electronegative atom and less electrons around the other side of the molecule. And so that creates a permanent dipole as opposed to the instantaneous dipole. So anything that's polar has dipole-dipole force. So a lot of the times you'll need to maybe make a Lewis structure, figure out what the geometry of the molecule is to see if it's going to be polar or not, and then you could say whether or not it has force or not. So again, everything has dispersion forces. Polar molecules have, they also have dispersion. However, that's literally a drop in the bucket when it comes to these intermolecular forces. It's sort of a really stupid example. But it's if I took two train cars and I coupled them together with the coupling between them, and then I added some glue to that. Yes, the glue is helping those train cars stick together, but it's not really doing anything and it would be fine without the glue. Or if I tied a rope between me and somebody else, and then I also held their hand, the rope is going to hold us, hold us together stronger than holding hands would. So the dispersion force is there, it does something, but we don't care about it because the dipole-dipole force is so much stronger than it. And we can see that, again, remember we said for dispersion forces, as the molar mass gets larger, the dispersion force will get larger. Here we have two things that are approximately the same size, so their dispersion forces should be about the same. But formaldehyde is polar, and so its melting point is negative 92, which is still not a very high melting point. But compared to ethane, which is negative 183, it's a much higher melting point, right? much closer to zero. And that's for the same size. Yeah, for the same size. Now, dipole-dipole forces are not all created equal. We can have stronger or weaker dipole moments, meaning the difference from one side of the molecule to the other, we can measure that difference in electronegativity, essentially. And so 0 0.08 is basically nothing, and that's propane. And so as we increase that dipole moment to get stronger and stronger dipole-dipole forces, we also increase the boiling point all the way up to acetonitro. That's the difference in electronegativity. It's comparing how positive one side of the molecule is to how negative the other side of the molecule is. If one side's a lot more negative than the other side, then we'd have a stronger difference in electronegativity. So that would be a bad dipole? Yeah, permanent dipole. So polarity, especially whether or not something's polar or not, super important for whether or not things will mix. So the term for whether or not two solutions will mix homogeneously is miscibility, which I remember as mixability, because it sounds the same. Because if I put, so this is pentane and water, Pentane's nonpolar, water's polar. I can put those in there. I can mix them, but they will immediately separate back out. And actually, the reason that they separate is because the water molecules really like being next to other water molecules. It's like having magnets next to each other. If I put something that's not magnetic in the way, they'll push that thing out of the way if possible. So all of these pentane molecules just get pushed out of the water so that the water can be close to, 
other water. No. It's, yeah, water is like the magnet, so it's got positive and negative ends. Those are all trying to get close to each other. The pentane doesn't have any positive or negative end because it only has dispersion forces. Because it's only dispersion forces, the forces all want to stick to each other. Other forces. I thought we'd have a slide on it. But I did want to make a note of these are the same molar mass. I can have something with a higher molar mass that only has dispersion forces that will have a higher boiling point than formaldehyde, like cooking oil. I actually don't know what the molar mass of cooking oil would be off the top of my head. We know that cooking oil is a liquid at room temperature. Negative 92 is not room temperature. So that's because it's much, much larger. So that dispersion force will always increase as you increase molar mass. And so there is a point where I can have a high enough molar mass that the dispersion forces there are stronger than the forces in something that's much smaller. So we gotta be comparing things of approximately the same size. Oh, actually, I forgot to mention this, we were talking about dispersion forces, but geckos and like lizards will use dispersion forces to stick to ceilings and walls. They don't have a sticky substance on their feet. They just have an incredibly high surface area. So it's making a lot of contact and then that allows dispersion forces to hold them to the wall. Neither. It's all instantaneous dipoles. It looks like magic. There's some scientists who have made some special materials that have that same effect. If you touch them, they wouldn't feel sticky, but they can grab onto stuff like they're sticky. Yeah, it is actual dispersion forces. Now, most of the time when you actually touch something, the amount of contact, like you feel it and you're like, I can feel it, it's solid, my hand is touching it, but the amount of contact there is limited by how much your hand touches it. So when you look at it like a gecko's, the pad of their foot, it like splits into lots and lots of these little fractal, I don't know, like hairs, but those are able to make almost complete contact with the surface. So if we could do that, you'd be able to, we would also be able to climb walls probably, but can't do that. Anyways, so dipole-dipole forces. Which of these would have dipole-dipole forces? Did you say B? Why? Yeah, so we do have a difference in electronegativity and You've probably done enough Lewis structures of carbon at this point to know it's only gonna have four bonds. So usually what we're looking for, is it asymmetric in some way? Or are there lone pairs, asymmetric lone pairs on the central atom? So this would have a tetrahedral shape. And then this is not the same as those other ones, so it would be polar. So it'd have... Yeah, as long as they're not evenly distributed, so square planar is actually a good example of something that has dipole or something that does not have it's like XEF4. There'd be a lone pair on top and a lone pair exactly opposite on the bottom. So because they're opposite each other, that means this side, one side, the top would be negative by some amount and the bottom would be equally negative by some amount. So we measure like a dipole moment. There needs to be a difference between the sides. So I essentially take the negative charge of this side, subtract it from the negative charge of that side. And since they're equal, it would end up being zero, essentially. No, I just drew carbon tetraiodide. Yes, but why? Yeah. So now we've got something that's just two atoms. You're just looking for, all you need to find is a difference in electronegativity between these two. And so hydrogen is a lot less electronegative than chlorine. So there would be a dipole moment. That would have also. And carbon tetraiodide, because it's perfectly symmetric, which you can't exactly tell from a Lewis structure, depending on how you're drawing it. Because Lewis structures can be drawn any way you feel like it, basically. But oh no, it's not symmetrical. But it's like, also I drew it, I'll say it because I drew it. I drew it stupid. This is a weird way to draw it. 
But it also, even if you're drawing it like in a completely normal way, like water, you might draw like this. I wouldn't say that's a stupid way to draw water, but it also hides the fact that this is bent, and so this would be polar. So don't trust your Lewis structure, except to tell you how many bonding groups and how many lone pairs there are. That's what you're using the Lewis structure for. So when I draw this one, I know that there's four bonding groups, so that's tetrahedral. And I know that the chlorine is different than the hydrogen, so I know it's gonna be polar. Carbon tetrahydride, also a tetrahedral. So unless one of these iodides was something else, this would be nonpolar. Yeah. Geometry. Yeah. So yeah, use Lewis dot structure. And then that tells you the geometry. So like this xenon tetrafluoride, I didn't draw the lone pairs on the fluorides, but this would be square planar which is how I know that these lone pairs should be opposite each other. Which again, depending on how you draw it, you might not see. And I'm not saying like you would be drawing it stupid. This is dumb. Don't do this. Spread things out. In general, spread things out. But that doesn't always tell the whole story. So just be aware. Okay, so yeah, B and C, those had dipole forces. Ah, dish. So we've got a, an electrostatic potential map for acetonitrile. The more red part, that's the negative. The more green or blue part, that's positive. So how would these acetonitriles line up with each other? Oh, I should write maybe it's N carbon, and these are hydrogens. You say B, D? D. So that would put the nitrogens next to each other. Nitrogen's negative. So put your negative next to your negative. A. Yeah, so the A where this would be the negative end, this is the positive end of the other. So it line up positive to negative, just like a north pole of a magnet would line up with the south pole of another magnet. Like this would be the partial positive, or sorry, partial negative. That's partial negative, this would be partial positive. So yeah, A. Whatever lets those line up the best. Kinda. And again, these are not standing still unless it's a solid. And even then, they're wiggling a lot. Constantly moving around. This one would be attracted to another one, but then they'd also be like moving around. But in general, negative ends will try to line up with positive ends unless the kinetic energy throws them apart. But then they'll just try to find another negative end, basically. Huh? Any kind of negative? It could be a different molecule, yeah. Not in acetyl nitrile, but water in acetyl nitrile. And that's actually brings up a good point. That's why polar things mix with polar things, because they each have positive and negative ends that allow them to line up like these two acetyl nitriles. Whereas you throw something that's nonpolar in, and it doesn't have a way to interact with the positive or negative, and so it ends up just getting pushed out of the way. Okay, super dipole dipole force, hydrogen bonding. It's a very special and specific situation that causes this, where we have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, fluorine, or oxygen. Uh, the reason is because they are small electronegative atoms. Because they're small, they're able to get really close to each other. And then because there's a big difference in electronegativity, that means that the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen are stealing an e even larger amount of that electronegative, or of the electrons around hydrogen. So you get what you can think of as a super force that will then want to interact with other fluorines, oxygens, or nitrogens. Most of the time this will be in polar molecules, but NH4 plus has dipole, or has hydrogen bonding, but is technically nonpolar. But because it has that hydrogen bonding, it's able to still mix with polar substances. But most of the time, if it's not polar, then it won't, be, won't have hydrogen bonding. 
So in ethanol, for example, the primary place where the hydrogen bonding takes place is between an oxygen, a hydrogen on one atom, and the oxygen and hydrogen on another. Where that hydrogen is so starved for electrons, it'll go and form a quote unquote hydrogen bond interaction with an oxygen on another molecule. And then the cool thing that water does is because each water has two hydrogens, it has like double hydrogen bonding. So each water molecule can hydrogen bond with two other hydro or two other water molecules. So I don't know what the actual numbers are, but something like twice the amount of hydrogen bonding. So about, I would guess in the neighborhood of twice the amount of intermolecular forces, yeah. Well, because this, well, it's like this one is hydrogen bonding with two other water molecules. Normally it would just be one, yeah, so then it'd be double. Oh yeah, yeah, I just drew another one in to show that each of these hydrogens could be hydrogen bonding to another water molecule. Yeah. So really strong intermolecular force. So again, comparing things of similar size. So I got ethanol and dimethyl ether, same molar mass, but ethanol has hydrogen bonding. So its boiling point is 78.3, getting close to waters. But dimethyl ether is negative 22. It's a much lower boiling point because this doesn't have hydrogen bonding. Now the hydrogen bond, again, it's not hydrogen, it's not the fact that hydrogen is bonded to the water. This is not a hydrogen bond, or we wouldn't say that bond is hydrogen bonding. It would be the interaction between this one and another oxygen. That would be the hydrogen bonding. That we're talking about. So between separate molecules, we say it's really strong for an intermolecular force it is, but it's still only two to five percent as strong as an actual covalent bond. So this is why water, water has a molar mass of 18, which is higher than all of these which have higher molar masses. But water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, whereas the rest of these are less than zero, where they boil. Um, and that's because it's got the extra hydrogen bonding. And so even H2S, just because sulfur is larger, it doesn't have the same special hydrogen bonding interaction that oxygen does because it's farther away from the hydrogen and therefore the forces are weaker. So it breaks the trend. So which has a higher boiling point, HF or HCl? So you just gotta remember fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, those are the hydrogen bonding elements. So HF. Do you have a I think you're thinking of, if I had something like this, so this oxygen has lone pairs, and then if I put water in here, which has lone pairs, this would this be dimethyl ether. This oxygen doesn't have a hydrogen of its own, but it does have lone pairs. So the hydrogen from this water could form a like pseudo hydrogen bond with the oxygen of this other molecule. Yeah. It would be one way from the water to that other oxygen. But I think that's probably. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be weaker because part of what's happening here is that the hydrogen or the oxygen is stealing so much of the electron density from the hydrogens. 
So it is also more negatively charged than this oxygen, because this is bonded to carbons instead. So it is also not going to interact as strongly with this hydrogen. So why well, when you say pseudo-hydrogen bond, that's what I think of. Yeah. Okay, the last intermolecular force we're going to talk about is the ion dipole force, which is a little bit different than the one we did in the lab. So in the lab, the other one was ion force. So ion force is between two ions. The ion dipole force is between an ion and something with a dipole or forces. So this is how water dissolves most salts. Um, it's because we have an ion and we have a dipole. So the water molecules, they rip the ions off and then surround them with either the positive or negative end, depending on the charge of the ion. So you can see the chlorine's got the hydrogens pointed at it. The sodium's got the oxygens pointed at it. And it makes almost like these little bubbles that surround each of those ions. So really strong intermolecular force, because remember these, especially the dipole in water is already really strong. So there's a really large dipole moment. And then when those are allowed to interact with or can interact with a true positive charge or true negative charge, you get a really strong attractive force there. All of the forces then lined up. You had dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. And this really summarizes everything that you need to know about intermolecular forces. Dispersion, easy. Everything has dispersion. I think probably the hardest one is actually the, because you need to determine first if the molecule is polar. If you can do that, then you should be okay on, hydrogen bonding is easy. Hydrogen attached to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. If it's got that, it's got hydrogen bonding. Ion dipole, I guess builds off of the, because you can tell if there are ions, if there are actual charges, if there's a salt, so metal, non-metal. But then you also need to know if the thing it's dissolved in is a, has dipole dipole force. Yeah, the ion dipole force has to be stronger than the ion force. So things that are insoluble like silver chloride, AgCl does not dissolve in water. So the ion is greater than the ion dipole of Ag plus and H2O or the Cl minus and H2O, which is why it doesn't dissolve, or at least doesn't dissolve very much. Technically, all salts dissolve some in water. Sometimes that number is just so small, that amount that does dissolve is so small that it's practically zero. I think, I don't remember what it is, but there is something that has a solubility of 10 to the minus 31, and I think that's moles per liter. So 10 to the minus 31 is pretty much zero but it's not zero. If anything, formal charges can give you an idea of ion, ions being present in a solution. So if you had an ion force, like Cl, actually, let me do, so nitrate, which would be a minus, okay, is going to have, I believe it's this, given a negative one and there's a positive one. So like when nitrate interacts with an ion, so if it's potassium, then the potassium would be on one of these oxygens and not like on the nitrogen. There are cases where like the charge could be on the central one, but even this, this isn't going to associate with two of them. And again, it's resonance structures. So these aren't actually a minus one. So I guess the short answer is no. I had to think about it a bit to get there, but yeah, because even formal charges are just a way to determine the best Lewis structure. They're a made up thing, which again, everything's made up. So to varying degrees. All right, which of these would have the highest boiling point? Now we're thinking all the forces. 
Which of these has dispersion forces? Yeah. So if you're ever just, I don't know, just write out all the forces. Now, if we're thinking just to find the one that has the highest boiling point, we can go straight to the strongest forces. Would any of these have ion dipole forces? No, we don't have any ions. So what's the next strongest force? Hydrogen bonding. So do we have any hydrogen bonding? Yeah. So A has hydrogen bonding, capital H. It would also have, and then CO or carbon monoxide would just be dipole-dipole. And dipole-dipole forces, so like if these all just had dipole-dipole forces as their strongest, we'd have to go to like dipole moments to compare them. And you'd have to be given those. I'm not gonna expect you to calculate them in any way. So you could basically say dispersion forces, they all tie, these tie it, but that means that methanol, CH3OH, has the strongest force, so it's gonna have the highest boiling point. Little fun fact, hydrogen bonding is actually what holds the strands of DNA together. It's also the reason that hydrogen bonding not DNA strands. Hydrogen bonding is the reason that hair straighteners work. Hair straighteners, yeah. It's generally hydrogen bonds between the, was it keratin that makes it hair? That causes it to be curly. And when you heat it up enough, the heat breaks those hydrogen bonds between the different strands. And then if you hold them straight, then they reset in that straight configuration. Now, as soon as you get it wet, that also resets the hydrogen bonds and then they'll go back to their natural state. Yeah, that's a fun fact. Okay, we've talked about all these intermolecular forces. We've talked about a little bit of what they do in terms of like boiling points, melting points. Higher, inter stronger intermolecular forces, higher boiling melting points. Um, they're also responsible for surface tension, viscosity, and capillary reaction, which I'm gonna go over super fast. So, like a paperclip, paperclip shouldn't float in water but it can float on water because of surface tension. So all of these water molecules underneath it are holding on to each other, just like they're holding on to the strands of this spider web. It's also the reason that a lot of bugs, so those like water skitters that like float around on the top of the surface of the water, they're using surface tension. Otherwise they would sink. And this is the same reason that nonpolar substances don't mix in a polar substance, because the water molecules want to be close to water molecules and they'll push anything else out. And that means on the surface of the water, there are all these water molecules are trying to hold onto each other. And so anything that goes into the surface would separate them. And so as long as the force isn't too great or you spread it out enough, like with the paperclip, you can actually float something on the surface that shouldn't be able to float according to regular buoyancy. So again, this happens because water molecules holding onto each other. These ones on the inside have six neighbors, essentially, that they can interact with, but the ones on the surface only are being pulled by the ones underneath them or to the sides of them, which causes the whole thing to constrict. And it pulls inward. That also means that in space, water that's just floating without touching anything forms a perfect sphere. So the water wants to be as close as possible, and to do that, it minimizes the surface area so that the most uh, water molecules possible can be on the inside. Viscosity, another result of intermolecular forces, is the measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. So if you try to pour something, water pours real great. Oil, not as much. Syrup pours even slower. Honey pours really slow. And that's because those things have stronger intermolecular forces. So it's the liquid molecules trying to move past each other in order to pour that causes viscosity. So if the intermolecular forces are stronger, it's harder for them to move past each other. There's a pitch drop experiment is what it's called. It's been going for 70 years or something, maybe 100 years now, where somebody thought pitch is a liquid, but it flows so slowly that nobody had ever seen that happen. So somebody put pitch in basically a funnel, and I think it's dropped, there's been one drop of pitch in the last hundred years because it's so viscous. 
Okay, viscosity, oh yeah, oil. Oils are designed to maintain their viscosity at high temperatures. So it's cool because they're polymers that want to be coils at low temperature. So that reduces their surface area, which reduces the intermolecular forces. But when you heat them up, they start to unwind and that increases the surface area, which increases intermolecular forces. So even at high temperatures, you can have the same viscosity, which is important for engines, right? Because if they got hot and then the oil got too free flowing, wasn't viscous enough, then it wouldn't be able to cover all the parts that it needs to cover. And capillary action, also caused by intermolecular forces. We got a bunch of tubes here. Probably not blood, but I don't know. In a smaller or in a wider tube, it climbs up the tube less. And that's because the thing that causes water to climb up these tubes is that the water is attracted to the glass. Or usually this, whatever the surface is, could be anything. But water really likes glass. The water starts to cling onto the glass and it'll climb up the glass a little bit, which pulls up the water behind it because they all want to stay together. And so if you've got a really small capillary tube, that liquid can climb really high up that tube because all of the water up this column is basically adhered to the sides of the walls. Yeah, it'll suck it up. I'm not sure if it's the same reason that paper towels will do that or clothes will do that. If you dipped your shirt, got shirt got dipped into something, then that water will spread out through the fabric usually. Might actually be capillary action also. But one example of something that doesn't have this capillary action is actually a reverse mercury. So the water, we get the uh, meniscus, so it climbs up the walls a little bit. Mercury does the opposite. It really has no attraction or very little attraction to the glass, and it would rather stay with the mercury itself. So you get the convex meniscus. You actually see this on the barometers in the lab. Cool, all right, so this is where we actually need to talk about something again, vapor pressure. And we looked at this a little bit and the process of vaporization just means to go from a liquid to a gas, yep. Okay, so vaporization, right? It's a liquid turning into a gas. And actually somebody, I think in my Chem 20 was actually asking, what's the difference between like boiling, vaporization, and evaporation? Vaporization is like the most general term. That's just anything from a liquid to a gas. Evaporation is at specifically less than the boiling point. So water at room temperature evaporates. Um, and then boiling, of course, is vaporization happening at the boiling point of that liquid because you've heated it up enough. So vaporization is the most general. And then the opposite is condensation. So for basically any liquid, you have... Again, just like gases, when we talked about gas laws, the temperature of it is essentially the average kinetic energy of all of those molecules, meaning the average speed. So in a liquid, that's the same thing is true. And there's something we could think of as the escape velocity or the escape energy, the amount of energy required for a liquid to break, for a liquid molecule to break free from the liquid and become a gas. And so when we increase the temperature we're increasing that average kinetic energy of all of the molecules, and some of those at the high end of that sort of distribution of possible energies have enough energy to escape. And as we increase the temperature, we're pushing more and more of the molecules past that line to the point where they evaporate. So increasing temperature will increase the rate of vaporization. Now, if you do that, okay, never mind. next slide. Again, you can also increase the surface area of a liquid to increase vaporization. And this really only applies for things that are in an open situation. So if I poured out some water on the table and left it in like a drop or one small puddle, then that would evaporate more slowly than if I took that and just spread it out over the entire table. Because the only water molecules that can escape are those at the surface. So by increasing the amount of surface, I increase the amount of uh, water molecules that can escape. And again, intermolecular forces also come into play here because if we have strong intermolecular forces, it's a lot harder for those molecules to leave. So we could call volatile liquids or ones that are uh, vaporized easily and non-volatile liquids don't vaporize easily. 
Now, the amount of energy, and you've already seen this a little bit, but the amount of energy that it takes to evaporate is the amount of energy that it takes to overcome the intermolecular forces. So when they leave, they also take energy with them, and that decreases the energy of the remaining molecules in the liquid. This is why sweat cools you, especially here, and that's why a dry heat is nicer than uh, humid heat, which is why this room feels awful because it's muggy. It's humid in here, so the evaporation's not working as well. But it's an endothermic process because that extra energy leaves. And then if you flip that, condensation is an exothermic process. So as water or liquid condenses, it's adding additional heat wherever it condenses. And so like a steam burn, where the steam is condensing, releases a lot of energy, in addition to it just being hot. This also causes temperature fluctuations, or temperatures to not fluctuate where places, in places that are humid. So that's why in deserts, it'll go from being really hot, like here, it'll be like 105 during the day, and at night, it can cool down to 70. Whereas in San Francisco, much, much smaller difference in temperature. So the energy associated with this, and this is where we're going to start skipping around a little bit. I actually think we're going to talk about vapor pressure. Yeah. Skip around a little bit because we've done some of this calculation. The heat or enthalpy of vaporization is the amount of energy it takes to just go from a liquid to a gas, not including any amount of energy it takes to increase up to boiling point. Although the vaporization energy required at boiling point is a little less than that at just room temperature. And the, well, it says always positive, but it depends on the direction. All right, so if we're going from a liquid to a gas, that's always positive. We always have to put energy in to make something go from a liquid to a gas. And so then doing the opposite is when the sign changes. If I'm going from a gas to a liquid, then energy is released. That's the exothermic process. And then we use delta H, right here, it's the same value, negative 40.7, positive 40.7. You use the positive or negative depending on if it's vaporization or condensation. All right, so in a sealed container like this Erlenmeyer flask, put a stopper on it, the liquid in here, water will start to evaporate, just like it would if we left it out on the table. The difference is that on the table, there's basically an infinite space that it can expand into, and it just leaves. In a sealed container, eventually those will bounce up to the top of the flask, they'll bounce back down, and then they'll condense back into the liquid. Now, at first, the rate of evaporation is gonna be really high, and the rate of condensation is practically zero. Somewhere in between, now the evaporation is still going, but the rate of condensation has picked up and then when we reach an equilibrium, that's where the amount that evaporates is equal to the amount that condenses. And so you reach this dynamic state where the amount of gas particles isn't changing, the amount of liquid particles isn't changing, but there's constantly some going out and some coming back. The, in a dynamic equilibrium like this, the only thing that changes the vapor pressure is temperature. The surface area has no effect on the vapor pressure. Again, because we're talking about a sealed container, because if I increase the surface area in here, what would that do to the rate of evaporation? It increases it. And what does it do to the rate of condensation? It also increases it. Because now there's a larger area for those water molecules to come back and hit the surface and become a liquid again. So increasing the surface area inside of a sealed container increases the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation by the same amount. It'll find an equilibrium, yeah, yeah. It'll come to some equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. So if I take the top of this off now, the condensation would slow down because the water molecules can leave. But because they're trapped in here, eventually they run back into the surface. So graph, this might look something like this, where when we start the experiment, the rate of condensation starts to increase. 
or sorry, yeah, the rate of evaporation stays the same the whole time, but the rate of condensation starts to increase until it matches the rate of evaporation. And then if I increase the temperature, this rate will go up, and then the rate of condensation will also increase until it again matches the rate of evaporation. And that's because as I add more gas particles to the space above the liquid, that also increases the number of gas particles that can come back and condense. So it naturally finds that. And that's what we call the vapor pressure. So like in lab today or on Friday, the first part of the experiment is that you'll have basically water trapped in this little U-tube and you're gonna heat it up and you're gonna cool it back down. And yeah, as you increase that vapor pressure inside of there by heating it up, the gas, the water vapor that you've trapped, because it's gonna start evaporating more, will increase. There will be more water vapor and that will push out against the atmospheric pressure. And then when you let it cool back down, then the rate of evaporation will slow down and more of that water vapor will condense. And let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how most electricity is generated. They boil water until it becomes steam. And then they take that high pressure steam and run it through turbines. And as it spins those turbines, the pressure decreases and it cools and then gets returned back to the boiler. Yeah, so basically, yeah, nuclear power plants are just using nuclear fission to generate heat to boil water. So it's a really fancy way to boil water. Most electricity generation is boiling water. Now we've got more solar and wind. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. I think so. I missed half of what you were saying, but we talk about it later because I want to talk about this is Le Chatelier's principle. If I have this sealed piston, basically, if I leave this, it'll reach some dynamic equilibrium. If I pull up on this, that would decrease the overall pressure above this. It would start to create a vacuum. Some of this water would then evaporate until it reached the dynamic equilibrium again, which would be the same pressure. It would just pull more water vapor. Oh, actually, because I asked you this already. So what happens to the water to the vapor pressure of a substance when its surface area is increased at a constant temperature? So again, I've got a got some container that's got liquid. Right, we have some vapor pressure, so this evaporation would be equal to the condensation. If I could magically make that container larger, my rate of evaporation would increase, but then my rate of condensation would also increase. And yeah, at first, the rate of evaporation would be increased, but the vapor pressure is at the dynamic equilibrium. And so we would end up reaching the same pressure above that. So vapor pressure remains the same. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, we can plot temperature versus vapor pressure, and it does not give you a straight line. It gives you a curve. Meaning that the amount that vapor pressure increases doesn't just increase linearly, so it's not like one to one. If I double the temperature, it doesn't double the vapor pressure. It more than doubles. It's an exponential curve. So we, faster than at a one-to-one, -one, increase the amount of uh, molecules that have enough energy to leave. Now, the boiling point of something is where you reach, where the vapor pressure of the liquid reaches the ambient pressure. Because right, the, vapor pressure, is the uh, vapor pressure is the pressure of liquid that you get in a sealed container. If I increase the water, the temperature of water up to 100 degrees C, and assuming it's one atmosphere or 760 torr, now there's enough energy that all of the water wants to become a gas. And so the boiling, normal boiling point will be where the vapor pressure equals the ambient pressure. And this is why if you go up to higher elevations, the ambient pressure decreases. So it's not gonna decrease by like down to here, but 
even if you go up into the Sierras, you might decrease it so that your boiling point is now 96, 95 degrees Celsius instead of 100. And if you're cooking, if you're cooking anything that requires boiling, it's going to take longer because the water's not as hot. The atmospheric pressure gets lower as you go higher. So if the, if you went really high, I don't know how high you'd need to go to get the pressure down to here, but if the ambient pressure was, atmospheric pressure was 600 torr or millimeters of mercury, then the boiling point would be like there. So that's even still, that's like 94. So wherever this line crosses the ambient pressure is where the boiling point would be. So again, boiling point of the liquid is the temperature at which the liquid's vapor pressure equals the external pressure. And the normal boiling point is at one atmosphere. So for any questions that are asking you about water, normal boiling point is always going to be 100 degrees C because we're assuming one atmosphere. And then, oh yeah. So the other thing that happens is once you get up to that boiling point, that's where the temperature stops increasing, like we talked about in lab. All of the extra energy that's getting dumped in here goes into turning the liquid into a gas. So you can add more heat and you can add heat faster. It will not increase the temperature. It will only increase the rate of boiling. So it'll boil faster, but the temperature still won't change. And that's where you're going to use the delta H of vaporization for boiling. So the clausius clapeyron equation is the equation that explains that curved line that we saw in the previous graphs. This is the regular equation. So the vapor pressure is equal to beta, which is some constant, times E raised to the, wow, the delta H of vaporization, so the enthalpy of vaporization, divided by R and T. And this is, again, this is R equals 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. The easier form to use for most things that we're going to be doing is the natural log. So if you take the natural log, now we get the natural log of the vapor pressure, as well as negative delta H of vaporization over R times one over the temperature, which gives you the equation for a straight line. And so then you can remap this and get the clausius clapeyron equation as a straight line. And so this is partly what you'll be doing for lab is that you'll, as you're increasing that, um, Increasing the temperature, you'll have a water bath, you'll have a little udiometer kind of thing in there. As you're increasing the temperature, it increases the vapor pressure, which you'll calculate based on the volume increase. So that volume will increase, let you calculate the temperature or the vapor pressure. And then you plot those, the natural log of those numbers versus one over the temperature in Kelvin. And you'll get a straight line, and then you will be finding delta H of vaporization for water by taking the slope of this line and dividing it by R. Cool. So there's the two-point equation, which basically takes, you can start from one point on the line, and this is the one we did in lab. Start at one point on the line and calculate the vapor pressure at another point without having to graph it. Just make sure you get T1 and T2, P1 and P2 lined up together. Yep. Okay. And that will do it.